Istanbul, at the confluence of East and West, Europe and Asia, and a focal point of world events for more than 2,000 years. What better place could there be to begin a series of conversations with international figures who have been at the centre of political show business or sporting drama, and relax with them over a glass of Turkish tea? Our series of interviews will take us to other global hubs, but the tea, well that will remain a constant feature of our talks. I'm Alex Salmon, the former First Minister of Scotland, and as I prepare for my discussions with our first guest, John Berkel, the legendary and controversial Speaker of the United Kingdom House of Commons, I reflect that Mr Berkel is the, the man who defied a President of the United States and lived to tell the tale. Turkish Tea Talk with Alex Salmon on TRT World. I'm now joined by that legendary speaker of the British House of Commons, Mr John Berko. John, your, your first visit to Istanbul? My first visit, indeed it is, to Istanbul, but assuredly not my last. I'm delighted to be here, delighted to be speaking to you, and delighted that we're doing so right next mm. to the Bosphorus. Yeah, How fitting that is. It's quite a sight, isn't it, John? Indeed. But, uh, Mr Speaker, what exactly does that mean? What, what, what is this great... Uh, office of state. The Speaker of the House of Commons is the referee or umpire of the proceedings of the House. It was my job to keep order, encourage people to take part and to try to cut down on the number of people who had to be excluded altogether as a result of bad behaviour. And it goes back a long way, doesn't it? I mean, you're, you're talking about three quarters of a millennium of Speakers of the House of Commons, are you not? Yes, it goes back a long way, and the first generally recognised speaker was a couple of hundred years before the fall of Constantinople. So that gives you a sense of how far back the office dates. Well, that's a fair time, and <laughs> 200 years before the, the conquest of uh, Istanbul by the Ottomans. Uh, that's, a, that's the amazing. In, now, over sorry. that period of time, a, a number of your predecessors met a, a sticky end, did they not? Yes. Originally, the Speaker was so called because the Speaker was supposed to be the King's spokesman to Parliament. Over generations, the English Civil War, the battle for the establishment of democracy, that has changed and the Speaker has become Parliament's spokesman to the Queen or now to the King. But originally, the task was to communicate the King's wishes. If the Speaker upset the king, the speaker was going to have his head chopped off. And the truth of the matter is that no fewer than seven of my predecessors met their end on the executioner's block. One was killed in battle, and a further poor unfortunate soul was brutally murdered. Well, you didn't lose your head, obviously. No. But you had some uh, controversy, shall we say. Yes. And probably the leading one is when you defied a president. Uh, you, you defied a newly elected president of the United States, Donald Trump, who wanted to address Parliament, and you said no. I did. It wasn't written down anywhere exactly what procedure should be followed when the idea was bruited of a foreign dignitary visiting to speak in Parliament. It was generally done, as so many things were in the British Parliament, Alex, as you will know, by consensus. Yeah. And put simply, if the government of the day wanted to invite somebody to speak in Westminster Hall, the government would say to the Speaker, please issue the formal invitation, please agree to chair the session, make some introductory remarks, and the world will be a happy place. It will all go very smoothly. I thought, no, this sticks in my craw. This egregious individual, this loathsome boil on the backside of humanity. You're talking here about the former President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Yes, I apologise for my understatement. I probably ought to put it a little more explicitly than I have done. <laughs> but to return to my theme, this loathsome boil on the backside of humanity had only just been elected. He had, of course, infamously banned Muslims from entering the United States. So he was 
an absolute, explicit, unarguable racist. And it seemed to me, on those grounds alone, he shouldn't be invited. Added to which, Alex, he had literally been elected only days ago. Now, Theresa May, the Prime Minister at the time, obviously had the idea in her head for some weeks because Number 10 wrote to me and said, well, how would you feel, Mr Speaker, about Donald Trump coming to speak in Parliament? And I said, well, I think it's an extremely bad idea. So let's get this right. This is at the beginning of 2017. Donald Trump has just been elected, yes. so he's had the inauguration. One of his first visits is to the United Kingdom. He obviously wants to address the Houses of Parliament, the Commons and the Lords and the Great Westminster Hall. The government clearly wants it to happen, but you as Speaker said no, and you did that as almost a retaliation for his ban on Muslims entering the United States. You gave him a, a taste of his own medicine. Well, I suppose I did give him a taste of his own medicine. I didn't think of it in those terms. I didn't conceptualise it as some sort of battle plan. But my instinct was to protect Parliament. And in a nutshell, Alex, I thought, what on earth is happening here? The Prime Minister can ingratiate herself with Donald Trump if she wishes, but she shouldn't do so at the expense of the reputation and dignity of the House of Commons, though. She said, well, President Obama did. And I said, yes, but the answer to that is twofold. First of all, President Obama was vastly more popular in Europe, and he was the first black president of the United States of America. And secondly, President Obama, Prime Minister, was invited to address both Houses of Parliament and Westminster Hall more than two years into his term as president. What you are proposing to do is to invite a hugely unpopular, manifestly racist, widely loathed president of the United States who's just been elected to come and address us in Westminster Hall. And you expect me to invite him and to chair the session, and the answer's no. I think we can have a look at that uh, exchange now. I would myself have been strongly opposed to an address by President Trump in Westminster Hall. After the imposition of the migrant ban by President Trump, I am even more strongly opposed to an address by President Trump in Westminster Hall. So there we have it. You've banned uh, the president, the newly elected president of the United States, from entering uh, uh, the British Parliament. Now, there must have been some kickback on this. There must have been people wouldn't be delighted uh, in high circles. I mean, did you have any thought that you might follow your seven predecessors and have your head chopped off? I didn't think that I was likely to have my head chopped off. There was what you might describe as modest turbulence in the <laughs> short term. There was consternation on the Conservative side, not by any means universal, but there were ministers, not just the Prime Minister, who were very annoyed with me, and there were some right-wing Conservative MPs who were relatively benignly disposed towards President Trump, who similarly were angry. They felt that I'd overreached myself. The whole of the opposition forces were on my side. And interestingly, Alex, you'll be familiar with this phenomenon, there were quite a number of government MPs who were privately against Trump coming who sidled up to me to say, well done, Mr Speaker, thank you, we don't want him coming. Well, that was uh, uh, one of the controversies in your turbulent times in the, in the chair. But the other underlying controversy uh, was the European Union uh, and mm -hmm. uh, the referendum uh, in 2016, which decided to withdraw from the European Union, and then the, the parliamentary interplay, which was to give effect to that popular decision. Now, the people who are in favour of withdrawing, the government of the, the day has come, Boris Johnson and Prime Minister like that, were in favour of withdrawing, and they felt that you in the chair were basically a secret remainer, that you were trying to thwart their democratic mandate to withdraw from Europe. How would you respond to that? No, I wasn't trying to thwart their mandate. It wasn't for the Speaker either to deliver Brexit or to try to prevent Brexit. It was for the Speaker to try to facilitate the legislature, to facilitate MPs, to facilitate the House of Commons. My very simple modus operandi, my rationale, Alex, was Parliament should have its say and Parliament should have its way. The root, if you like, the origin of the critique of me as being 
anti the government on Brexit and anti-Brexit was that I didn't follow what they thought was the desired procedure. For example, I allowed votes on amendments that the government didn't want. And a number of times the government was then defeated. The government then complained bitterly to me that I shouldn't have allowed those votes. And my very simple answer to the government was, it's not my job to protect you from the absence of a government majority. If you haven't got the numbers, matey, hard cheddar. Prime Minister Johnson said to me, Mr. Speaker, I, 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 in general, in general, in general terms, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very considerable, considerable fan, a considerable fan of yours. But I, can I say, sir, can I say uh, that I, that I, that I, that I think that this act, this, this act you allowed, you allowed, you allowed to be passed has been, has been very damaging, very damaging, very damaging to our uh, uh, attempt to get a good Brexit deal. Uh, and, 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 and I'm told you shouldn't have allowed it, understanding orders. And in essence, Alex, what he was saying is the standing orders dictate that the government controls the agenda. And I said, Prime Minister, that is true unless and until the House suspends that standing order. Put simply for your international, our international audience, this was his mistake. He thought that it was law that the government should control the agenda. And I said, no, Prime Minister, it's not law, it's just normal practice. The House owns its standing orders. If the House wants to suspend its standing orders, it can do so at any time, and that's exactly what happened. This, I think, was a little bit beyond the intellectual compass of Prime Minister Johnson. Now, as it happened, of course, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson went to an election, won a majority, uh, and solved that immediate crisis, but uh, it didn't solve the long-term crisis of Europe, did it? It didn't solve the long-term crisis of Europe and the long-term crisis of Britain's relationship with the European Union remains unresolved. Why is it still a problem? Well, you can pass whatever policy you like, but you can't get away from two facts. The European Union is our closest market and the European Union is our closest power block and we have voluntarily exited from our largest proximate trading market and our largest proximate power block. And that's bound to cause dislocation, economic damage, political harm, and that's exactly what has happened. Now, from that statement, uh, John Berko, you're, you're pretty clearly a Remainer. You're, you're pro-European. Now, as Speaker, of course, you had to remain impartial. After you stood down as Speaker, you joined the Labour Party and you've made outspoken pro-European comments. What is it about that issue that uh, makes you delight, dislike the, the leaving side so much? Well, I didn't like the fact that they tried to circumvent and bypass Parliament. Also, there was an absolutely abhorrent racism in the Brexiteers' argument. People may remember... That's a strong statement, John Burke. It is a strong statement, but people may remember that the Brexiteers in their campaign said that if we stay in the European Union, 70 million people can come marauding over to Britain from Turkey. And the purpose of that tactic was absolutely obvious and frankly despicable. They were trying to frighten voters into thinking huge numbers of Muslims were going to come to Britain. And if you want to stop the so-called Muslim invasion, which is what they purported it would be, you've got to vote for Brexit. I thought that was, frankly, a loathsome, despicable racist tactic. They've never apologised for it, but that was at the heart of the Brexiteers' campaign. And I confess that I thought that was utterly despicable. And many of us, would, uh, a few more people from Turkey would be a grand idea for the, the United Kingdom. Uh, I think uh, Turkey uh, residents coming to Britain would be perfectly welcome. I, I, I want to turn to the, just looking over your, your term. Now we've already, I think, established the, the person you, you like the least <laughs> of the great international figures that you, you, were, you, you hosted in the House of Commons. Did you have a favourite for I mean, Of all the, the, the figures, President Xi, the other dignitaries, do you have an absolute favourite of the person who impressed you the most? Yes, the person who impressed me the most was President Obama. Oh, another Barack president. Barack Obama, <laughs> President of the United States, first black president of the United States, struck me as a supremely 
impressive individual. I met him the night before he spoke to Parliament, attending a banquet at Buckingham Palace, and then on the day. Until today, no American president has stood on these steps to address our country's parliament. It is my honour, Mr President, to welcome you as our friend and as a statesman. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States of America, Barack Obama. There were two things that struck me in particular. First, he unprompted went to shake hands with all of the doorkeepers who do an important but largely unrecognised job in the House, in the interests of members and the smooth operation of the House. Nobody suggested it to him. It was his idea. It was not recorded on camera. That was just pure instinct. I remember, 12 years later, the look of absolute delight on the faces of those doorkeepers, that he went up to them and shook their hand. That was class. That's the first thing. The second thing was he started his excellent speech with a wonderful opening line. Mr. Speaker, I am told that the last three <coughs> visitors to address both Houses of Parliament from these steps in Westminster Hall have been the Queen, the Pope and Nelson Mandela which is either a very high bar or the beginning of a very funny joke. <laughs> well, that would disarm uh, the, uh, the members and the uh, well, People and loved it. Of course, uh, and, the best, it. and the best way to start. The late Queen, the Queen Elizabeth, uh, every year uh, attends the state opening of, uh, of Parliament. The, the Speaker's role in that, of course, is central. Are there any insight stories from behind the scenes with, with yourself and the, and the late Queen? I remember showing Her Majesty the Queen the chapel of St Mary Undercroft, which is well known to members of the House, and I pointed in particular to the place where the very controversial left-wing Labour MP Tony Benn had entirely of his own volition placed a plaque of the suffragette Emily Wilding Davison. He had no authority from the House to do it. He did it, if you like, as an act of defiance on his part or an act of reverence for Emily Wilding Davison. And I pointed this out to Her Majesty the Queen and she said, oh yes, Mr Ben does like to do things his own way, doesn't he? <laughs> she was very pleasant, she was very engaging, she was very charming, she did have a talent honed and nurtured over decades, no doubt, for putting people at their ease. And I may be a very self-confident, some people would say, bumptious character, but was it a little disarming to be in the presence of Her Majesty the Queen? Well, of course. Was it mildly intimidating? Of course. Did you know you were doing something very different and feel a bit self-conscious? Of course. But very quickly, she put me at my ease, as she did with everybody. Uh, of course, when, you, when you're you speaking to, to the late Queen uh, uh, as First Minister of Scotland, I, I was conscious there had been many First Ministers before me. Uh, the Prime Minister, there was many Prime Ministers she'd met before and she'd been the Queen. I suppose that was the same for the, the Speaker. She'd met many Speakers of the House of Commons in her long reign. Yes, I was the ninth Speaker of the House whom she'd known. So I was just the latest occupant of the office. All of this was... Very commonplace from her point of view. And naturally puts you in your place, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. I was made to realise that I was a bit part player in the constitutional <laughs> evolution of the United Kingdom. When we were speaking earlier, John, down at the, at the Bosphorus, you were asking about the, the sea lanes. Uh, and we, uh, we thought about the, the Black Sea deal uh, and its importance. Uh, now, I mean, it's not a message there. I mean, looking over at Asia, we're in Europe uh, conducting this interview. Uh, the Bosphorus and the vital sea lane and, the, and that deal. Any lessons with your experience internationally that you would take from that? Yes, that deal was the only initiative that has brought Russia and Ukraine together. It did feed people, even if only for a little over a year. It could be a template for 
a wider role for Turkey in international and global conflicts. I think that partly depends on the demeanor, the comportment, the mindset, if you like, not only of global leaders, but of Turkey's leaders. I think it is up to Mr. Erdogan to win the confidence of the international community. And the fact that the UN were involved in the Black Sea deal, it makes it a strong, a strong statement of hope for the future. Yes, I think it does. I mean, that is one example, and only one example, but it is a successful example. So I think that on the principle that we should try to view the glass as half full rather than half empty, I think it is quite an auspicious sign of what could happen in the future with goodwill. Of course, there was some recognition of that role in the Emmy Award that TRT World won for uh, the documentary Off the Grid about Ukraine and, the, and indeed the Black Sea Grain Deal. Yes, indeed. Now, Becca, one of the things you're famous for, one of the many things you're famous for, is, is how you brought about some form of order to, to the House of Commons, how you, you calmed the, the troubled waters, uh, and your, your famous signature shout where, uh, to get the members of Parliament to behave themselves. Yes. Tell us a bit about that. The historic role of the Speaker is to keep order, and when order is lost, it's the historic role of the Speaker to restore it. And that has always been done, in the first instance, by uttering one word, order! <laughs> order! And did it always work? It didn't always work, and it didn't always work, in, in particular, it didn't always work immediately, but ultimately it did work because if order was not restored, the debate would not continue. And I think I sometimes said, I've got all the time in the world. I'm not in any particular hurry, but the debate will not continue until members have composed themselves. So I did used to say order on a very regular basis. I'm told that I uttered the word order 14,000 times over my 10 years as Speaker. And I don't mind telling you, Alex, that there was one member who is not globally recognised, who was noisier than any other. There was a Labour member who was by background well, well, I'm a glad lawyer. you said a Labour member. I thought you were looking at me for a second. No, you were a comparatively well-behaved member, particularly <laughs> when you thought you were getting your own way. But there was a Labour member who was spectacularly noisy, noisy on an industrial scale, not once, not twice, but every single day. And his shtick, if you like, was to yell every day, shocking, it's a disgrace. And then he would point at some government minister and say, behave, with no H, behave, whilst conspicuously failing to do so himself. And I used to say to him, order, Mr. Turner, calm yourself. And if you cannot calm yourself, you will have to go and lie down in a dark room and take some soothing medicament, which you will find therapeutic. Being part of the, the House of Commons when you were Speaker, or even watching you know, when I was First Minister of Scotland, the you always seemed in control of events uh, and you always seemed to be in command of the situation basically because you you knew the rules but was there ever a moment where you were looking at a rowdy house of commons or even telling somebody to go to to seek a medicament to even with your erudition famed erudition you felt i'm not going to be able to settle them down i'm going to have to suspend them for the day was there ever a moment where you thought things were getting really out of control yes towards the end of my tenure five weeks before I left office, when the House was debating Brexit, the atmosphere was toxic. And it was all the more toxic for the fact that the Prime Minister was himself whipping up the atmosphere as much as he possibly could. He kept referring to a piece of legislation that he didn't like as the Surrender Act, the Surrender Act, the Surrender Act. Passions were inflamed. On both sides of the House and on both sides of the Brexit argument, people were in a foul mood. And I did think that there was a danger that the situation could get completely out of hand. I did think about suspending momentarily. I thought on the whole it would make things worse, not better. And we just had to keep going. Whether I made the right choice, I don't know. But the honest answer was, at that moment, I did think this is in danger of getting out of control. I think ultimately the House came to its senses, but it was, if I may say so, and I do, no thanks whatsoever to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister 
didn't care how angry the House got. He didn't care that a Labour member got up and said she'd received death threats in her own constituency. And she said she thought the Prime Minister should lower the tone, lower the decibel level, try to calm the situation rather than inflame it. And instead of showing any sort of empathy with her at all, he said he'd never heard such humbug in his life. I mean, it was an act of gross insensitivity on his part, but entirely in keeping with the personality of the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister didn't care about anybody else. This is Prime Minister himself. Johnson. This was Prime Minister Johnson. And now John Berko is a, a former Speaker of the House of Commons. You're free to say what you like, to do what you like. And you've been starring in the NBC series Traitors. Uh, what's all that about? And I want to know, was there anyone in that reality television series to keep you in order? Oh, I'm afraid there was. Yes, the host, the squire of the castle, was Alan Cumming, the Scottish actor who lives in the United States. I had to submit to his authority, and on at least one occasion, he said to me, John, order! <laughs> when I was talking when I shouldn't be talking. <laughs> John Berkel, I can't offer you a soothing medicament, but I can offer you another sip of, uh, of Turkish tea. Uh, and the cookie, which I bought earlier. And I think we can agree on one thing, and that is there is much to be said for Turkish tea. I could, I've already told you that I enjoy Turkish coffee. I love strong Turkish coffee. But I could get used to Turkish tea. But I'm really glad you said that, John Berko, because in celebration of your appearance in Turkish Tea Talk with Alex Salmond, we're going to present you with a Turkish tea set. Thank you. That's very thoughtful. Bless you.